Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education. I'm Jonathan Krasner, a core faculty member at the Mandel Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this ongoing series of conversations with scholars in Jewish education. We created this series as a way to share scholarship in the field of Jewish education with a broad audience of, of educators and Jewish leaders. Uh, in order to make a deep and lasting difference in the lives of learners and in the vibrancy of the Jewish community. That's our mission. And today's session and our other sessions help to serve our mission by getting important ideas out into the world. We encourage you to take a look at the Mandel Center events page to see the rest of our upcoming events. We're delighted to have so many of you join us live, and we hope to be able to take some of your questions as we go along. So feel free to put those questions uh, into the Q&A section on the bottom of your screen. We're also recording today's session and we'll make the recording available afterwards on our website for those who couldn't join us today. But the recording will only capture the presenters and not the audience, so don't worry about that. Today's session is a little different than the other sessions that we've produced over the last couple of years because our guest today is John Levison, the director of the Mandel Center who's usually the one doing the interviewing. But today we're gonna to focus on a recent article that John's written about the prominent Jewish education leader, Seymour Fox. John's a philosopher of Jewish education and his recent article, in his recent article, he takes a deep dive into Seymour Fox's ideas about vision in Jewish education. John, welcome, it's good to see you. Great to see you too, Jonathan, glad to be here. So let's start with the backstory of this article. Um, your title is The Purpose and Methods of Philosophy of Jewish Education, A Critical History of Seymour Fox's Theory of Vision. So how did you decide that you wanted to revisit Seymour Fox's writings after all of these years and uh, the development of his concept of vision and education? Thanks. So I guess um, if I can be a little bit biographical for, for a minute or two, um, I um, I first met Seymour in the uh, in the early '90s. I was uh, studying at Hebrew University. Um, I was learning in the Hartman Beit Midrash, um, but I needed a little bit of more income. And Seymour gave me a job as a research assistant um, at what was then called the Mandel Institute in in Jerusalem. Um, and um, and I was sort of proximate to some of these ideas, uh, even whatever thirty years ago. Um, and so in one sense, I, I feel like I've been thinking about some of these ideas really for three decades. Um, and, um, you know, fast forward a few years when I, uh, when I started my academic career, I came to Brandeis 2002. That was right when the, the Visions book, Visions of Jewish Education, um, was being published. And the Mandel Foundation created a whole set of um, of learning opportunities around the publication of that book. So there were kind of folk uh, study groups and meetings of, of practitioners, meetings of scholars. And, and this was a tremendous opportunity for me at the outset of my career as a philosopher of education to sort of get all of this um, sort of firsthand um, encounter with the ideas. And then I was also teaching from the book and I was exploring the ideas with students. So then starting in around 2003 and 2004, um, uh, Seymour Lavashalom passed away in 2006, if I remember correctly, and and um, and we didn't get to talk with him anymore, but but we were talking about these ideas through the end of, of that decade and into the next decade, and I started doing some writing about some of the ideas around vision. So in, in one sense or another, I've been, I've been thinking about this for for a long these ideas for a long time, and this, this paper was an opportunity to go back to Seymour's writing in a more systematic way. You know, I'm very clear, I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, some of my best friends are historians, but I'm not a historian, I'm a philosopher. But it was an opportunity to go back and sort of take the this set of, um, of writings that Seymour had produced over the years and look at them very carefully. And I guess the, the last thing I would say about that is, um, to my mind, the, the best thing that we can do to honor, honor somebody's memory and somebody's contribution is to take their idea seriously. And that means giving them time, right? Like really looking at them carefully 
and it also means critiquing them. Um, and and um, and I hope you know. Obviously, I want to do that in in a constructive and a respectful way. But for me, that's a mark of respect. And and I guess I one more thing. I guess I would say I think we don't we don't do this enough in. Jew, in, in scholarship of Jewish education. I don't think we have enough opportunities to look back and to talk about ideas that have been published, um, important ideas, and reevaluate them and explore them and examine them and, and do kind of scholarship about those preceding ideas. I totally agree. One of the things that I find when I'm uh, teaching my students is um, how relevant the past is to present uh, dilemmas that we have as Jewish educators and as researchers. So as I think you alluded to a minute ago, I'm a historian. Um, when I want to do research, I go into dusty archives. I like nothing better than that. But tell us, how does a philosopher go about um, doing research? Like, what's your methodology like? Yeah, so um, uh, there, there's a, a, there are different answers to that question. And in the beginning of the article, I spell out sort of some different, what I call different modes of philosophy of education. But in this case, um, I had a, a, a group of articles that, that Seymour had produced starting in 1959, in which he, in various ways, had been working and reworking and reworking a set of ideas. And, and that was my data set, as it were. That was where, and I didn't have to look in the archives because I just had them. And fortunately, the foundation has has produced a, a volume. They're readily available. They're all, they're all um, collected. Um, so I didn't have to do the archival work. But also, um, in order to kind of define the project for myself, I very clearly said, I'm going to not pay attention to the enormous contributions that Seymour made in institution building, um, that that's you know, which is not to say that, uh, of course, I respect those those contributions, but I wanted to kind of bracket them, and I wanted to not, for example, do oral histories. That's also really important. If I were writing a biography of Seymour, then that's the kind of thing that I would I would definitely feel like I need to do. But I was I wanted to kind of carve out a different kind of intellectual project and see what would happen. And you never really know until you actually do the work and and work it through. But see what would happen if I go back to these. Um, various essays punctuated over time to see how the idea, the ideas of vision and, and the idea of theory, how that how that developed over time. Great. So tell us what your main argument is in this article. Yeah. So look, the 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 central idea for Fox, and and this goes back to the earliest writing, is that ideas are important. That practice that is not guided by ideas, educational practice that's not guided by, by ideas is aimless, he sometimes says, or lacking direction. And he's really worried about that. And it turns out that he was worried about that even as a relatively young man. I think he was uh, 30 when he wrote that first article. Um, and uh, and I'm worried about that too. Um, the ter I, I tend to use the term idiosyncrasy for the idea that that there may be like a, a whole bunch of different things that are, that are going on in a particular practice, but they're not focused on um, on on goals or on purposes. Um, and so that's clearly one of the continuous threads through his work, and it's helpful to document that. And at the same time, um, what emerged as I was working through the essays were um, I guess four main points about the idea of vision. And I think about these as kind of four ongoing challenges that emerge when we're trying to help to make practice more vision driven, more focused on purposes and, and less idiosyncratic. So I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna talk about all of those, but I'll just I'll just mention what they are now and maybe we will circle back to them. Um, the first is what I call the problem of comprehensiveness, and that's the how big do ideas have to be? Do, do they need to be sort of comprehensive philosophies that encompass everything, that give us answers to, you know, the, the biggest, all the biggest questions? Because that's that's how Seymour sometimes talked in a very ambitious way about vision, and that's, that's uh, one challenge. The second challenge is... Um, I call this the problem of whose vision, right? Who, 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 whose vision counts? Um, and here we have to both give Seymour enormous credit because from the outset, he was always a pluralist. He was always committed 
to having multiple visions. He never said, I, I couldn't even imagine him saying that the Jewish tradition says, you know, this is what a Jew should be or something like that. He just had no patience for that. He was always attuned to kind of the diversity within, within the Jewish intellectual tradition. And at the same time, all four of the core visions that he ended up um, developing were quite obviously written by a group of people who sort of kind of looked alike, uh, meaning that they were all scholars of a particular kind and they were all men. Um, and, uh, and that just raised the question of, of where visions come from and whose vision counts. Then there's a problem of individualism, which is to say, when we, when we think about the question of the educated Jew, what's my, what's my ideal educated Jew? That's a really important question. And we can't ignore the question, or I would argue we shouldn't ignore the question of, well, what's the ideal community? How can educational institutions not just serve individuals, but also serve communities or societies? And then the last is um, the what I call the problem of cognitivism, or sometimes we can think about a kind of hierarchy between theory and practice and the idea that sometimes, that Seymour sometimes writes about where first, you do all of the deliberation. It's almost like you sit with a bunch of really smart people with a whiteboard and you just figure stuff out. And then you can start to worry about practice and you start thinking about what he sometimes says, translating ideas into practice. And that's also a challenge. The idea that, you know, get the philosophers in a room, let them figure out the answers and then, then worry about how that actually works in the world. Yeah, I mean, just going off on that last point, one of the things that really struck me when I read the article is that here you have arguably the leading thinker in Jewish education in the second half of the 20th century. And he doesn't seem to have a lot of faith that teachers are going to do the right thing here. It seems like he feels like these philosophers from on high need to micromanage everything that goes on um, in education. Is that a fair reading? I mean, how, how do you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, let me first make the question even sharper. Um, Fox, in addition to, you know, loving the, the scholars of Jewish history and, you know, loving Maimonides and loving Sadia Gaon and loving Achad Ha'am, loving Karo, all those, he also loved Dewey and he loved Schwab. And these were people who were deep, deep thinkers about practice and about how ideas are enacted in practice and emerge from practice. So it's it's a really it's a really good question. And in some ways, it's a thread throughout throughout the article. So I guess I would say three things in response to, to the question. Um, first, I do think it's important to, to acknowledge that he changed over time. So as he there's always ambivalence for sure, but as he developed over time and and my hypothesis here is that, you know, over the years, over the decades, he was engaged with extraordinary educators and he built programs for extraordinary educators. So all of that time working with educators, he actually did moderate his view to a certain extent. And he started to realize the way in which um, uh, important ideas are found within practice. Um, he didn't completely integrate that. So that's why I say, I call it ambivalence because he doesn't quite in, integrate that kind of newfound appreciation with the prior kind of deliberation first model. So, but, but he does change, he certainly does. Second, I also think it's important to acknowledge, and I just alluded to this, Seymour invested deeply in educators. It, it, comparatively, for example, he, he didn't invest that much in curriculum. But he did a little bit of work in curriculum along the way, and he was involved in some of the projects of the Melton Center along the way in curriculum. But really what he cared about was finding great educators and helping them grow. And he was certainly elitist about this, no question, but you know, building up the senior educators program in, at, the, at the Hebrew University and building up the Jerusalem Fellows program. So it's not exactly that he didn't have faith in educators or faith in practitioners. He we might say that what he really felt is we weren't investing enough in them. We need to invest more in practitioners to help them um, become great. And I, I think that's a, a reasonable position. Um, and I guess the third thing that I would say about the question is 
um, I think we have to acknowledge that he was really motivated. He was motivated by the gap that he perceived between the tradition that he knew and loved and the greats, whether they were contemporary great scholars or historical great scholars, like the best of the Jewish intellectual tradition, the gap between that world and educational projects that he saw around him, um, what he felt was happening in the field. I think that there is absolutely something true about that. And I just want to say that's what motivated him. That's what anime, that's what got him up. And I imagine that's what got him up in the morning that said, you know, we have to work harder. We have to do better. We have to create better, better systems, better training programs, better ideas. Um, and in a way that's somewhat uncharitable to, to practice um, on Seymour's part. Um, uh, I, I happen to think that there are lots of interesting, there always have been lots of interesting things happening in, um, in the world of practice. And part of our goal as scholars is actually to lift up those, the best examples of those. Um, and, and that was not necessarily the, his, his primary focus. Um, and I also think we have to be realistic about, um, you know, we have to not compare apples and oranges. So we can't expect, you know, it's not a fair comparison to hold up, I don't know, Maimonides or Sajid Gaon against, you know, the local fourth grade Hebrew school. Like that's not a fair comparison. Um, and uh, and so we have to be realistic about, you know, how, how, um, how, how we make those comparisons. But but really, I want to make this point. What his dissatisfaction with the status quo, there you're, you're onto something, Jonathan. He we can say that he was not. He, there was a, a way in which he didn't really appreciate at moments. Really didn't appreciate practice. But that's what motivated him. That's what got him going. That's what got him to invest in institute, institution building. That's what got him to. I mean, one of his genius genius. Again, this is his biography, not his not his ideas, but. He was fabulous at getting people to contribute money toward mm -hmm. the philanthropists to contribute money towards these projects. And partly that was driven by his sense that we're not doing as well as we could. Yeah, really, really interesting. You know, as you were talking, I was just thinking how, you know, as you mentioned, he revered people like Dewey um, and Schwab, who arguably were very learner centric um, in their philosophies, but at the same time, he had this great reverence for Jewish tradition and text. Do you think that he recognized that there was a little bit of a contradiction there in his tendency to elevate the text over the learner? Really good question. I, I don't think that he was attuned to that. I think that he and and um, I think that we see a few moments in his writing when he we might we might think now looking back at that that's that's where that divide opens up and I I think he felt wholeheartedly that he was a student of Dewey and a student of Schwab and also a student of Menachem Brinker and, and of course of Israel Scheffler and, uh, and, you know, Mike Rosenack, uh, even though Mike was younger and, and, um, uh, and, and Tversky Tversky too. And Tversky for sure. And, and Michael Meyer and, and, um, and also the greats, right. And the Am. Um, so I, I think he genuinely believed that he was holding these things together. And there was a moment there's a moment in his writing where he sort of acknowledge. It looks like he's about to acknowledge that Schwab has a different model of deliberation, and that the model that he's proposing for deliberation diverges from Schwab. And then he says, "It's this really. It's it's a moment where you can almost see him like struggling." Then he says something like, uh, "But Schwab's ideas, ironically, Schwab's ideas are good in theory, but but." In our particular situation of Jewish education, our situation is different. We're, we have too many external influences. Our, you know, the the, the situation is is too um, fragmented on the ground, and so we really do need to be much more abstract, do much more abstract philosophizing. And that's a place where you might have expected him to see it, but I think he felt like he just needed to hold together all the people that he revered. 
you know, there's, uh, I don't know if I ever mentioned this to you before, there's a letter in the archives where, um, you know, Camp Ramah uh, in the late 1960s, they were very concerned about the drug culture. Um, and they, uh, they asked Schwab, like, what should we do about this problem? And Schwab basically says, they're kids, let them experiment. And, sh and, you know, and Fox is like, no, 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 we can't do that. You know, and it's just, it's, it's, it, what you were talking about really reminded me of, of that interaction, you know? Right, right. And, and I guess it's worth saying something about the idea of, ex of educational experimentation, because that really captures, well, I don't know about drug experimentation, but certainly educational <laughs> experimentation captures a, a different stance. Um, uh, and here again, um, I'm focused on his writing. And if you look at what he, at the work that he did based at the Hebrew University, at the Milton Center, and then later at, at the Mandel Foundation, there was enormous investment in, in um, educational experimentation, enormous investment in the people who were doing educational experimentation. I think it's also worth mentioning um, his colleague and in, in, for so many of these years, um, Danny Marom, who was uh, helped with the Vision Project and, and a number of other projects. Um, and um, and it's really impossible to think about sort of Fox's work without um, without Donnie Marom. Um, but there was a way in which he didn't quite integrate that emphasis on experimentation into his ideas. And I think, Jonathan, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll just speak for myself. When I think about an educational experiment, I think, okay, so we've sort of got an idea here. Let's let's try it out. Um, let's see what happens and let's see what we can learn from that experiment. Um, let's, there may be new ideas that we had not encountered. We never occurred to me sitting in my office, you know, my philosopher's office, my philosopher's armchair here at Brandeis University. It never occurred to me that there, this particular tension would emerge or a question would happen or what happens when we actually listen to the students and really start to pay attention. That's what, when I think about experiment, experimentation, that's, that's how I imagine kind of learning from the field. Um, and Fox it really didn't, in his writing, again, he really didn't get inside of that mindset. Instead, he thought about experimentation as testing ideas. And if the idea failed, your first thought, he says, your first thought is, well, that was a problem of implementation, right? right? It, the, the practitioners didn't get it. And we, we philosophers, we philosophers of education all up and down the ladder, we have to help translate ideas better into practice because we're clearly not doing a good enough job. We're not speaking clearly enough. We're not articulating the ideas well enough. Rather than saying, oh, wait a second. Actually, there's an idea, there's an emerging idea from practice that's that's really compelling here. Whether or not Leveson thought about it sitting in his philosopher's armchair. Yeah. So you mentioned before that you teach visions in Jewish education. Do you read it differently now that you've done this research or? or not? That's a great question. I, um, I think that for me, the evolution of my teaching about vision has also been a, um, an evolution of teaching about what vision is. And so over time, um, I have started to introduce some of these ideas that I articulate in this paper, although in different forms in some of my teaching. And Jonathan, I'm sure you, you you agree that some of our ideas get worked out on paper and some of our ideas get worked out in our teaching. Um, and we kind of explore ideas in our teaching together with our students. And, um, and one of the key things for me is to help students to, I hope, appreciate as much as Fox ever did the power of ideas, but also to kind of demystify vision a little bit. And this goes back to what I was saying about comprehensiveness. I want to help students to think about, I sometimes just use the term animating ideas. Rather than a big vision, how can we think about animating ideas that are kind of closer to practice? Um, and um, and, uh, and and help students to interrogate actual instances of practice to find those ideas and we talk about them and deliberate about them and refine them and then bring them and bring them back. And I guess if I would say one more thing about that, it's I um I also think this breaks down some of the boundaries between philosophy and other kinds of scholarship. 
So I'm um, thinking, for example, about, I don't know, uh, our friend Shaul Kalner's birth, book about birthright, mm -hmm. or your, your work now about, um, uh, about Jewish day schools. So that is work that's examining an instance of practice and is really trying to understand what's happening there. And from out of that close examination, that's how we can learn about ideas. They may not be good ones, but we can, you can, the scholars surface them and then we can examine them and turn them around and, and sometimes also critique them. Yeah. So I can't believe that we're almost out of time. Um, this has been such a fun conversation, but I guess the last question that I'll ask you is, so after doing all of this research, um, why does Fox's work still matter to us today? Thanks. Um, so I, I, I feel enormous gratitude towards Seymour Alava Shalom. Um, he was personally extremely generous to me. And, um, and also the idea that there was a person who was dedicating his life to developing ideas for Jewish education. Um, for me, that was a revelation, right? Like, wow, that's, that's something you can actually do with your life. Um, and, uh, and that continues to be important. And, um, and I want to honor and lift up the proposition that ideas do matter. Um, that's not ideas at the expense of pedagogy or the expense of curriculum. You know, it's, I don't think about it as an either or, I, but it is absolutely vital for us to maintain our focus on the importance of, uh, of ideas. Education is not a technical problem. Right? It's not simply a question of like, how do we figure out the right technique to do X, Y, or Z? There, there are the questions about education as kind of fundamental as all of, of, um, of culture, Jewish culture. Um, and we need to invest in ideas. We need to invest in the people who develop those ideas. We need to be wary of quick fixes um, I think that's another legacy that we take from Seymour Fox. He talked about one of the things he talked, he called bandwagons. Um, he, he was afraid of people jumping on bandwagons and using slogans. I think that's also a really important um, takeaway. And most fundamentally, we, we should not be afraid and we should help our students, whether those students are undergraduates or, or professionals, we should not be afraid to ask why we do the things we do and, and how we might do things differently. That's, I think, the best way we can honor Seymour's legacy. Great. So John, when is this article coming out and when can our viewers read it for themselves? So um, it's available now in a kind of preprint um, and, uh, and the link should be, um, should be in the chat, um, but the article is gonna be in a, a volume, um, a fast shift in honor of, uh, of Johnny Cohen. And um, I'm told that it will be published um, uh, hopefully early in 2024. Great. Well, uh, thank you. Um, with that. Um, and, uh, and thank you so much for sharing uh, your, your wisdom with us and, and your experience uh, doing this research and, and, and everything that came out of it. And I want to thank all of you all who are listening, both those of you who are listening live and those of you that are going to listen virtually later. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. This is the last event of the academic year, um, but I encourage you to check out the Mandel Center events page to see the videos of our prior events. Maybe you missed a few along the way. Um, head over to our podcast page and subscribe to our podcast feed. John, any last words? Since no. you're, I'm, I'm sitting in your chair today. So. <laughs> no, it's been great. It's always great to, to talk about stuff with you, Jonathan. And, and um, we certainly look forward to having uh, a new slate of events in the new academic year. That's great. So when I uh, was told that I had to come up with a closing salutation, my son said, well, tomorrow is May 4th. So may the 4th be with you, everybody. And take care. Excellent. Thanks.